Can I close this Twitch tab? Um, yes. Okay. I love it. Our starting through our starting soon screen is us staring at you. <laughs> love it. Right, just like staring, no blinking. <laughs> I'm cracking myself up. Sorry. All right, we are live. Cool. So what's up, Sarah? What is up? So today we are gathered here to discuss a very important topic. Um, Mark, why don't you start by telling me what you um, told me about, was it your aunt or somebody who was mm. telling you or asking you for some advice? <clears throat> yeah, a friend of mine emailed me and I'll just share this one particular uh, story. There was a few people who, who messaged me right after Monday, uh, whenever the IPC report was uh, released, the latest one. And this one particular person emailed me and shared with me that she has a son, early 20s. And throughout the whole week, he was super depressed, super sad, angry, pissed off, just all the feels based on this report. And she just didn't know how to respond. She just, she acknowledged the truth. And, and then she knew, obviously, the work that uh, we do. And so she emailed me asking for suggestions and, you know, ways that she can maybe direct her son's emotions, feelings, anger, pissed offness towards something positive. So I gave her a handful of suggestions and links and things like that. And, um, and then, yeah, um, I think later that week, you and I talked about it and just sharing this particular story. And one thing led to another, and we started to have some really interesting conversations about where all this is coming from outside of the, um, the science stuff, outside of the IPC report. Yeah. And Mark, you say where all this is coming from. You yeah, mean the, where the all this climate anxiety. Yeah, exactly. This anxiety. Of the, exactly. Yeah, and it's been interesting the last couple of days since that report coming out. Reading all these articles about people responding, and not even just articles, but even people's personal um, updates on Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter about just oh shit, this is really bad. And so mm -hmm. I think collectively we're seeing more and more people um, waking up and realizing what's going on. Yeah. Um, and then what we wanted to talk about, like a couple of things. So there's a couple of things happening at the same time. Um, one is the IPCC report that came out on Monday. Um, and then all of the media coverage that followed and all of, you know, people's general reaction to that is it's climate anxiety. It's a feeling of helplessness. It's a sort of mass depression. Um, so we want to talk about that. We want to address that and the, the hard feelings and the anxiety and what can be done about it. Um, but it also led to a conversation that you and I started having about the media and what we can expect from the media and what we cannot expect from the media. Um, so before we get into that, I wanted to share a little sound clip. I don't know if this is legal. Can I legally share a... Um, another podcast it's like a little clip from another thing uh what do they say in the last four decades has been hotter than the one before and they've all been hotter than any time in the last you know several i think it's a hundred thousand years you can hear this? maybe one hundred twenty-five thousand years mm -hmm. it's almost a guarantee that the next decade this decade we're in the 20s is going to be hotter than the one before or this one and the one after that will be hotter and that causes all sorts of other problems it's the largest, most menacing source of rising sea levels all over the world. It means more of the world's ice is going to melt. In fact, in the Arctic, we're warming at two to three times the pace of the rest of the globe. Those glaciers that are shrinking all around the world are going to shrink even more. In some cases, they're going to disappear. There is nothing to stop its accelerating retreat. The ice sheets in Greenland and in Antarctica are going to keep melting. Within a few decades, we might have an ice-free Arctic which is a really horrifying thought. And both that and glacier melt and just the rise of temperatures is gonna keep the sea levels rising more and more. 
maybe five inches, six inches, seven inches, whatever. It could get five to ten feet before the end of the century. But All right, that's enough, right? <laughs> Jeez, I need a beer after listening to that. I know, right? And this is what's like uh, inundating the entire world, you know, in addition to news about the war in Afghanistan and I don't know, like a billion other things that are just terrible. Like the point is the news media loves to share when things are going horribly. You know what I mean? Like that to the media is good news in a weird twisted way because it means that they get more views and they have something to report and they have something to like pontificate about and they have um all these experts that they can then go and interview and ask them about their opinion and how like their take from it and it just like goes on and on and on you know it's free content for the news and they love this and so of course they are just digging in hard to the impacts of climate change, of the climate crisis. And Mark actually forwarded me this amazing um, article that helped us sort of focus our, our thoughts on this whole issue. And it was a Business Insider article. You just like saw it on Twitter, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, the headline is, the media frames the climate crisis as hopeless but that's because they're hiding the solutions. And so for me, that was the uh, ding, 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 ding. You know, the climate news coverage is digging in hard on the doom and gloom. This is hopeless. This is awful. It's a code red for humanity. And they're not sharing anything that people can do about it. And so, of course, the impact of that is everybody feels helpless. Everybody feels like we're doomed. I mean, what they're saying is this isn't going to get any better for at least 30 years, which is wrong, by the way. It's false. Um, we can do things about this. But they're just, yeah, they're just really, um, the news media does not have, what's the word, um, an incentive mm -hmm. to think about the long-term exactly. impacts of what they're doing. Well, they also don't have an incentive on highlighting solutions. Right. And, there, and, and you made a comment a few minutes ago about the reason, like, we only hear the bad stuff and that's by design. They yes. tap into emotional fears and all this other stuff, you know, that, that drives us to want to learn more in this kind of, um, uh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? This, um, this really weird way of like, um, oh, it's on the tip of my tongue. Like we're, we, we keep doing what we know is wrong, but we can't help it. You know, and so in, in this case, we keep watching the news. We can't help it because that's just how we get our information. And if we are solely relying on certain media outlets that we quote unquote trust, we feel that whatever it is that they report is the only accurate thing out there. Yep. And that's, that's, a, that's a problem. <laughs> that's a huge problem. It is a huge problem. So, you know, one thing that I did in my immediate circle anyway, as soon as I knew that the IPCC report was going to come out, um, I knew that what it was going to contain. Like, obviously, it's not going to contain any um, surprises. Like, ah, climate change is solved. <laughs> we, we would know about that already, right? So I knew that it was coming out and um, it was going to probably be more specific. It was going to be more dire because, you know, I, since the 2018 report, uh, I haven't really seen any major policy changes. So obviously we're, 
you know, not shortening the gap between action and the time limit that the uh, 2018 IPCC report said that we had to act. So obviously you can deduce that it's going to be um, sounding more red alarm bells and telling us that we have even less time to act. And so knowing that, and also knowing that the timing of the report coming out is before the next uh, conference of the parties, COP26, is it? Mm -hmm. um, which is supposed to happen in a month or two. September, yeah. Yeah, in September, okay, sweet. So they're putting that this report out so that the negotiators who negotiate on international climate policy and plan international next steps have the latest information. And so of course it's going to be code red and sounding the alarm bells because they want to influence the policymakers to do what's right and act in line with the science and take it seriously. So in my personal sphere, which is basically like I told my mom and then I posted on the Climate Designers Network, <laughs> um, I was like, hey, so Monday, this report is going to come out. Um, it's not going to tell you anything you don't already know. Like you have been hearing from you know me for ever, um, and in the community's cases, all of us, um, that the climate situation is an emergency and action it needs to be taken, and you know all the stuff that the, the report is basically going to be trying to tell people. So you already know this. You don't need to pay attention to the news. I know that the news is going to be dire. I know that it's going to be grim. Um, it's not for you. It's gener It's to generate the political, well, the social will that then leads to the political will to take bold and drastic action because that's what needs to be done. And so in a way I was kind of looking forward to um, all of that coming out and then hopefully sitting back and waiting to see what the policymakers do with that. But, you know, my warning was intuitively knowing that people would pick up on the headlines and feel pretty helpless and feel pretty anxious, you know, in climate anxiety. Um, so. And, and, if you're not in the space as much as we are, then that makes sense, right? If you have your normal life, raising the family, you know, nine to five, nine to nine, you know, overwork kind of thing, you're only focusing on what's in your immediate surroundings. And so the last thing you might want to take on as a hobby is learning and understanding the climate space. <laughs> and so it makes sense that the majority of people are feeling this way after this report came out yeah. because there's still unfortunately a small percentage of people that are in this space and even those that are in this climate space, you know, they still subscribe to what it is that you're talking about, Sarah. And maybe this is the difference between, you know, us and them in terms of designers. I mean, just one thing I like to say, maybe this is a segue into the next uh, topic is that as designers, I feel like we are optimistic by nature in a sense, where we look at a challenge and we try to find ways to make it better, to um, find solutions, to focus on what's working and amplify what isn't working. And so I think there's also, um, you know, kind of your, day-to-day -day worldview kind of thing in terms of how you would approach what the report listed out, you know? Yeah, definitely. So yeah, there's a lot of people that don't have um, that perspective. And I, you know, I, I heard from Mark what your aunt said. Um, and then I saw this tweet just randomly from somebody who said, you have a climate misinformation problem and they're tweeting to TikTok. Um, and she said, videos saying it's too late to do anything about climate change are going viral, which is leading to climate inaction mm -hmm. and a lot of mental health problems. And so, um,
I want to talk about two things. I want to talk about um, why the media reports things the way they do um, and why it's not it's misinformation, it's propaganda, it's not the full story. Um, maybe it would be a good time to show that video that you <laughs> just showed me. Do you wanna share that? Uh, sure, do you have it queued up? Um, if not, I do. I thought you might. I have yeah. a lot of tabs open. Yeah, let me find it. Yet another thing we're unsure if we can share, but what do they say, right. better to ask for forgiveness this is from youtube from like five years ago from lots Should of years fine, ago right? yeah here we go so the video starts about 60 ish seconds in so we'll just show you that part we need them to tell us so we can fall in line Democracy is staged with the help of media that work as propaganda machines. Media operate through five filters. The first has to do with ownership. Mass media firms are big corporations. Often they're part of even bigger conglomerates. Their end game, profit. And so it's in their interest to push for whatever guarantees that profit. Critical journalism takes second place to the needs and interests of the corporation. The second filter exposes the real role of advertising. Media costs a lot more than consumers will ever pay. So who fills the gap? Advertisers. And what are the advertisers paying for? Audiences. And so it isn't so much that the media are selling you a product, their output. They're also selling advertisers a product, you. How does the establishment manage the media? That's the third filter. Yee. Journalism cannot be a check on power because the very system encourages complicity. Hey. Governments, corporations, big institutions know how to play the media game. They know how to influence the news narrative. They feed media scoops, official accounts, interviews with the experts. They make themselves crucial to the process of journalism. So those in power and those who report on them are in bed with each other. If you want to challenge power, you'll be pushed to the margins. Your name won't be down. You won't be getting in. You've lost your access. You've lost the story. When the media, journalists, whistleblowers, sources, stray away from the consensus, they get flat. That's the fourth filter. When the story is inconvenient for the powers that be, you'll see the flat machine in action, discrediting sources, trashing stories, and diverting the conversation. To manufacture consent, you need an enemy, a target. That common enemy is the fifth filter. Communism, wow. terrorists, wow. immigrants, Whoa. a common enemy. A boogeyman to fear helps corral public opinion. Five filters, one big media theory. Consent is being manufactured all around you, all the time. Who made that? It's so good. So that, so that is a video I think I saw the video years ago and it was, uh, so it's basically the, the, the content of the video is taken from Noam Chomsky's book, Manufacturing Consent. Right. And if you, uh, if you watch Democracy Now!, the, the narrator, the voiceover is Amy Goodman. Um, but yeah, so he breaks down those five filters in that book much more than what the video does. But um, uh, knowing that we were gonna be chatting about this topic um, made me realize like, oh yeah, I forgot about this video. I should totally share it with you.
yeah. yeah it's so good like the visuals the mm -hmm. eyeballs and the um mouths and the, the people people um running the machine how their mm -hmm. eyeballs or mouths are so shut mm -hmm. it's just yeah. like so amazing yeah so anyway the point is um even if a journalist were to write an article that fully expressed the climate problem complete with the solutions because the solutions challenge that power structure that the media helps support, the media will never completely report on those solutions. And it really took all of those puzzle pieces for me to be able to formulate that sentence in my head and, and share it here. So thank you. Thank you for sharing all of that. It's amazing. Um, yeah, and I think it's just a, uh, an example of why we really do need to question our news outlets. Um, we can't just rely on, <laughs> you know, the the a quote from a particular news channel, fair and balanced, right? There's always going to be not always. Um, what we tend to go to mass media, there are people behind the scenes, and so we really need to question their intention. We need to question their motives. We need to question their sources. And so it makes total sense that a lot of these um, media outlets are focusing on part of the larger story, focusing on certain aspects of the story and not highlighting what we really do need to start talking about. And again, as I mentioned, you know, the fact that we're in this space more often than you know, others, you know, we're in, in the this space full time space. in the climate space. Yeah, we see this stuff, and you know, at some, you know, knowing that we we're going to be talking about this topic, it made me realize, you know, it, we kind of take it for granted. At least I kind of take it for granted because for me, it's just, oh, I'm getting my news from places that I trust, and I still, you know, kind of question that at times. But again, for those who just kind of have other things going on in their lives, and the last thing that they want to do is do more research or more you know, put more thought into where they're getting their news. Uh, they just, you know, turn on the TV or open up a browser and just kind of rely on what's in front of them, what's put in front of them. Right. And I want to um, veer off a little bit here and say the moral of this message is not just to question the media. Um, because we have a huge portion of society right now that really gets off on questioning the media to the point where they believe that the mass media is straight up lying sure. about yeah. science, about facts, about things that happen. And that's mm -hmm. not what we're saying. Right. Um, the mass media machine, I think, is still held to the idea that um, their reporting is fact-based. They're not just straight up making up stories <laughs> mm -hmm. right right and i'm pretty sure i don't know this for sure but i'm pretty sure that if um something were revealed to be false they would issue a correction right away mm -hmm. usually you see that happen um because if they report things that are false they would lose the trust of people and they would go out of business mm -hmm. so it's balance. not yeah it's not that they're not reporting the truth Mm -hmm. It's just that they're not reporting the part that challenges their business model and their power structure. Right. So, yeah. you know, there's there's like a two sided coin to this. And I think that I'll give credit where it's due. I don't think that people who are anti science are smart, per se, but I will give them credit for having a sort of intuition, perhaps um where they can tell that something is not being reported fully or that there's something not correct in the advertising i mean in the media in what the media is, is telling them um the unfortunate conclusion of that intuition is that they think the whole thing is false and they throw the whole baby out with the bathwater exactly. exactly and they don't believe anything that they see on the news and therefore they believe that COVID is a hoax and climate change is a hoax and they only listen to the talk show people the pundits and opinion editorialists on certain channels that they trust 
Mm -hmm. um, because those people speak to the, the intuition part of them. They speak to the feelings part of them and the emotions and say the things that feel right <laughs> in the gut of people who, you know, to their credit, could tell that the mass media isn't telling the whole truth. So, um, yeah, I, I wanted to interject that um, and just to say that, like, question the media, but like not <laughs> the way that anti-vaxxers question the media. <laughs> sure, sure, exactly, yeah. So I think you know, let's come let's come back to you know the the media that has been um, uh, publicizing or, or showcasing what the report uh, has in it, and you know the, your clip that you played earlier. You know, it's this, everything's on fire, everything's going to melt, everything's fucked. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, they are, that is true. You know, that is, that's, that's kind happening, of. That, that is happening. And, and again, no one knows exactly. We have all these models and AI and computers and things, and, you know, they're getting better and better each and every year. Um, but I think what we're trying to say is that let's, you know, let's not have that be the, the, the focus of the story. Let's yeah. Not have that be the main thing that we all talk about because it doesn't go anywhere outside of that. What do you do when, you know, it's like when you're at a party and someone, you know, kind of changes the topic and talks about a really depressing event that just happened. Yeah, my cat just died. It's like, oh, sorry, man. Like you kind of just kill the, the vibe. Yeah, <laughs> you know? I mean, how many in our audience, um, in our community, are, I am one of these people who at a party or something, someone brings up anything remotely related to climate. And then I'm like, climate change. And it's just a buzzkill. It totally mm -hmm. stops the conversation because people are like, mm -hmm. yeah, that's happening. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> and then everyone walks away from you. Yeah. Yeah. And so like all of that, I think that's a whole other topic is why people don't want to talk about climate change at all. And so there was a huge push for a while to get the media to even cover climate change mm -hmm. and, um, to talk about it as the emergency that it is. And now I think that that has shifted a little bit. Um, yeah. And it's, it's about the framing, you know, in that video that we just watched, there was the common enemy, uh, what, what do they call it? Um, filter. So putting everything through a common enemy filter, but I think the common enemy filter that they're using in this case is climate change itself is mm -hmm. the enemy. Yeah. So what they need to be doing and that what they won't do because it questions power is that they need to cover climate as genocide, you know, generational murder, um, intentional and knowingly committing murder. And when you frame it that way, you know, in that frame is a subject and an object and the subject is the person or persons or institutions committing the murder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they won't ever do that because put it, you know, putting it that way puts accountability on the institutions responsible for the crisis, which are the institutions that the media supports and is funded by and um, makes them possible. Yep. So instead, they leave that part out of the equation, which leaves people feeling helpless. And uh, this part is a little bit conspiracy theory, but, you know, nihilist, scared depressed, anxious people tend to be easy to manipulate and get them to buy more stupid shit. Mm -hmm. Distraction. Yeah. yeah. Like I'm going to go out and buy a bottle of wine to distract me from how depressed I feel. I'm going to go out and buy the new Red Dead Redemption or whatever, <laughs> um, whatever video game people are playing to distract me from, you know, and then I need a bigger TV because Mm -hmm. I'm so immersed in this escapism um, and a better sound system. So it's really good for business. It's really good for capitalism. It's really good for the advertisers, for everybody to be anxious and scared and depressed. But that's not the way that it needs to be. So what I would like to shift into now, if that's okay, is um, what we need to be doing as maybe independent climate communicators or um, maybe what we might want to talk about at parties instead of just climate change. Um, and there was one article that I found. Oh, here it is. This was published on Nova 
uh, rawmedia.com. I don't know what that is, but I like it. And the um, headline, the title, it's an opinion piece and the title is the IPCC can't predict how we fight back. And it's basically about, um, you know, they're like, okay, so on Monday, the IPCC delivered its sixth comprehensive assessment report, blah, blah, blah. The report made for grim reading. It warned that climate breakdown was now happening rapidly and yada, yada, yada. And then it goes into all that. And what I like about it is towards the end of the article, or like maybe the, um, last half of the article starts to say what is and isn't possible isn't just a matter of science it is principally a matter of politics if we wanted to stop burning fossil fuels we could if we wanted to build a just green and sustainable world we could the problem of course is that our governments don't want to they refuse to take the action required because they are wedded to an economic model that depends on growth, that incentivizes destructive practices for short-term profit, and that values the private accumulation of wealth over the continued existence of life on this planet. So... Can I add to that? Yeah. They're also, at the same time, in bed with large media corporations. Yes. So they exactly. have no intention of doing that anytime soon, enacting extreme progressive climate policy because it affects their bottom line. Yeah. So the point is we don't have to accept that the next 30 years will be more of the same heat waves and flooding and fire. Um, we don't have to accept the death and displacement of millions of people, which is predicted by the IPCC report if we do nothing. So I, I think that there's this um, media led feeling conclusion that this is baked in and done. Um, but look at over the last 100 years, how much change has happened when people stand up and demand you know change like in my lifetime i've seen the berlin wall being torn down and entire governments being reimagined and configured like nobody believes that that's possible with something as gargantuan as the united states and western europe and the whole world bank ally crap that's going on but in a way, the physics of the reality of the situation that we're in demand to change. And we have science and truth on our side to demand change. The growth imperative for never ending growth to pay back debt, debts that governments have been hanging out with for decades, it doesn't work anymore. And at some point, somebody is going to be like, all right, all right, I'm just going to walk away from this debt and we're going to start over. Hmm. Like they did at the end of World War II, all the allies, the leaders, the negotiators, whatever, got together and they designed a new monetary system in like 22 days and then released it to the public, not even in beta, didn't have a QA team. Come on. There were, I'm guaranteeing you, there were no women in the room. The colonies, the countries that were in developing uh, times were not invited to the table. Um, probably very few people of color in the room. Like this was designed by rich white dudes who were drunk on power <laughs> uh, and had, let's just be graceful, let's say they had biases they had um, no idea about evolution theory or ecological science, you know? Um, they had 
very limited knowledge about how the world works. And they had some half-baked theories that they called economy <laughs> science, which is not a science, it's a fake science. I'm learning. Uh, but they had theories about what would bring well-being and peace, which I guess were euphemisms for profit. <laughs> And, uh, you know, through trial and error over the last however many decades, math is hard. Um, the, the shit don't work, guys. <laughs> it's broke. But we're, I, I, we're, I, it doesn't work, but they're unwilling to admit it because they're in too deep. They have so much sunk cost in all of these infrastructures and systems that are already in place. And I think they're at a point now where you just say, fuck it, let's just squeeze everything as much as possible, every ounce as possible, right? Well, yeah, um, I mean, most of them are so old that yeah. they don't have to face the consequences. Exactly, yeah. So that's why it is on us and people younger than us even to stand up to them and be like, no, that's not okay. Mm -hmm. This is not okay. And they are using the media to make us complacent um, and anxious and nihilistic and everything else because that drains our energy from being able to say oh wait actually hey there's 20 million of us and like six of you so this is not okay yeah they know it works so they just keep at it and unwilling to highlight or put the focus on solutions unwilling to highlight the heroes that are already doing the work um it's not in their interest because for one it proves that this can be addressed climate you know can yeah. can be addressed but also it affects their bottom line as well so yeah. again like i'm so in it because this is what we do and you know talk to me about kelp farming regenerative agriculture carbon removal all these amazing solutions and there's just three out of countless solutions i mean obviously project drawdown was I think one of the first major, if I can use this word, breakthroughs in this topic, Sarah, that really yeah. and started climate up. solutions being exactly. articulated. And, because and nobody else would tell us that there were solutions. Right. And besides I've seen, get off of fossil fuels. Right. And which watching obviously is what needs to happen, but that's not on any of like you or me. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, we can't do that. We're not the decision makers there. <laughs> oh, let me just go turn the switch off in the other room. Right. Um, so then we all got convinced that like we had to turn our air conditioning to 80 degrees to save energy and that was going to solve it. Yeah. Well, you bring up a, a good point here. I think the other ingredient to all this too is that um, these organizations, these corporations, they're putting the onus on us by design. And so they're deflecting all of their responsibility towards us to change our ways. And as we all know, our individual actions, as good as they are, as, as much as we should all do them, is collectively not going to move the needle yeah. at all. And yeah. so, um, so Sarah, I, I want to bring this up real quick. You were talking about, you know, after World War II and, you know, all these people started to create this new, uh, this new economic structure. Um, I keep going back to, I know we mentioned this last time, the book that we're both reading, unless you finished, um, but I'm still reading Less is More. And I still keep going back to this. I think about this probably every other day. There's a blurb in there pretty early on about how it's crazy how we can't, we can't even bring up the idea of changing our economic system. That just is like, no, oh my God, what are you, some crazy lunatic? You know, like we can be so creative in terms of coming up with new technologies. How many iPhones are there now? 15, 20 <laughs> iPhones, right? We keep evolving yeah. and innovating all these other aspects of life, but yet we can't evolve or come up with a brand new economic system. I know, right? And it's for 25 or 30 years, um, the propaganda machine has been nailing this point home that came out of the Cold War, that socialism is bad, communism is bad, and basically tied um, anyone who believes in climate change to, oh, you must be a socialist. Mm -hmm. They have this like concept of the slippery slope to socialism and it's oh, so scary. Well, it's, it's the fifth filter, the common enemy. 
yeah so they've been using that common enemy to discredit anybody who understands climate science because they know that the solution is anti-capitalist and they somehow think that any anti-capitalist ideology is automatically what has come before and i think what less is more what jason hickel is saying and what you and i are saying is let's invent something new given all of the knowledge that we have based on earth science on ecological science on ecological economics now we have a branch of ecological economics um, we know a lot more about human behavior we know what market practices do work and don't work and what the results of uh, implementing them are um, we know more about what people want we know more about what makes the world better we know so much more than Karl Marx did or um, any of the scientists of the you know 1800s or whatever like or Adam Smith who invented capitalism yeah, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. we have history um, to go back to as well so we we have the knowledge yeah I mean know, we can so. take the what's good from any of those theories and philosophies and mm -hmm. ideologies and discard the parts that don't work. So we don't have to just slide back into something that people are, for whatever reason, scared of. We can basically create a new economy the same way they did at the end of World War II, create new rules that take into account the reality that we've learned in the last several decades. We've learned so much about how the earth works that is just not even baked into any of the policies surrounding our economy. And it's about time, like uh, several countries have been saying this since the 2008 financial crisis. You know, France came out and said, hey, you guys, we need to have a new um, Bretton Woods conference and like redefine the economy. And uh, I was just reading about it today. Someone else came out and said like, we need to do this. Um, it really is just, we need to demand that a new economy be designed to be based on the well-being of people within the now more well-known earth system of where we live the reality of where we live like this is not very hard i mean it's complex but we have all the information we have so much more information than we have before and so i think like it, it's just this like weird insecurity fear thing of like uh, I don't want to, um, I'm scared to try something new and like as designers, when a system isn't working, like that's good news for us. That means that all of our skills come into play and we get to take all of these desperate, disparate pieces of information and start connecting them together and making something coherent out of it and that's the kind of work that designers love to do so that's why climate designers exist i think this is a time for people who have the skills and tools to visualize complex information and help people communicate uh connections between different fields you know designers don't have to be an expert in every single scientific field but we know how to help all of those separate experts get connected in a cohesive plan you know that's what we do thank you for saying that because i feel like i'm always the one saying that bit <laughs> <laughs> and i reread the end of uh, Buckminster Fuller's Operating System for Spaceship Earth, mm -hmm. 1969, I think he published that. Yeah, I think Somewhere so. in the mid to late 60s. And that's the last thing he says is like the planners and the architects mm -hmm. of the world need to get together and take reality into consideration and put forth a new plan because the, the people running the running the boat right now do not know what they're doing. <laughs> they do not have the skills to make these plans. And this has been very evident since the end of World War II and everything else that's happened. Like it has not 
uplifted well-being, except for a few people, it uh, has not brought world peace, case in point, Afghanistan. And now we have ecological crisis to deal with that like they didn't even consider or know about back then. So it's time for a redesign. There's, there's so many things I wanted to say in the last couple of minutes, but- You can butt in, you know, just like interrupt me. No, 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 I, okay. Well, I'll, just, I'll say one thing. Um, I don't know if you've seen the Netflix series Explained. They're like 20 minute videos on a variety of topics. And one of the latest ones that actually came out about a week or two ago is, um, I think the title of it is, the, the end of fossil fuels or something like that explained mm, right cool. and watching it well two things um i don't think it went deep enough i don't think it went and this goes back to what we are talking about right there are people behind netflix making those editorial decisions to determine how much is in this 20 minute piece and how much isn't. And, what, and that's the thing what is not in that piece. Mm -hmm. And they did bring up the solutions towards the end, of course, in like 90 second clip, at, you know, compared to the 20 minutes that they had talking about the problem. The other thing I wanted to bring up, is, and this goes to some of the comments you just made, um, they had out of all people, they had a handful of, of people that they were interviewing out of all people, they had the former CEO of Shell, I believe. Uh, Lord Brown. I forgot his first name. Lord something Brown. Wait, is and Lord like a title? His, his, um, I think he was given it by the queen. He <laughs> He's some a Lord. Something. <laughs> He's yeah. An I, don't actual that, Lord. I don't know how that works. But um, <sighs> here he is talking about, you know, his, his latest thoughts and, and opinions currently. And I'm thinking, oh, why the fuck were you not thinking that when you're in the position of power? You knew what was going on. We all know by now and the you know decades ago these fossil fuel companies knew what they were doing it's no secret so him being in a leadership position decades even after that he knew what was going on and so it just really bugs me and you saw this a lot with um trump appointees in the white house they would quit in disgust or get fired and then write a book telling about all the secrets like say the shit now current like say it in the moment like you can save so many lives and you know you have to put food on the table too mark i understand <laughs> but i also don't anyway what i'm saying is um there's when you say that there's smart people to come up with new economic systems and all these new things i get it but there's also people in positions of power that know that they need to do this but they don't they're unwilling to so we can put together an a team of people to come up with you know all these new solutions at a systemic level but i think what we also need to focus on is at the same time how do we get those people that are already already in those positions of power out of that position you know so that those solutions that we do come up with can get implemented can actually be you know implemented at scale and so you know you see a lot of you know communal living places you see a lot of small towns trying all these like testing out all these different things which is great but we really need to amp that up we really need to bring that to a scale that's going to move the needle and i feel like if we i i love the local level approach don't get me wrong and we need to do that because as um sarah mentioned you know we need to uh test things out we're going to fuck up we're going to fail we're going to probably make some mistakes but if we do it at a smaller level, it has less of an impact to those fuck ups. And then eventually we learn from those mistakes. And then, yeah, let's start to, you know, branch that out into other areas, other industries. Um, but until we, until those people in power stay in power, it's going to be a lot harder fight to do that. Yep. One of the really cool things that it says in this article about um, the IPCC can't predict how we fight back is they say, we need to amplify the voices of the global south and act accordingly and they have a link here it says at cop 26 climate vulnerable countries are demanding the delivery of climate finance greater ambition from major emitters and a focus on loss and damage and if you click on that link it goes to the climate vulnerable forum which is something i didn't know existed but it's um it looks like it's a you know, a group of the climate vulnerable nations and their statement is very much questioning power. And it says it's not yet too late 
Um, yeah, so they're, they definitely have a lot more to say about what needs to be done and a lot more urgency to um, do that. And really, I don't think it's up to us to come up with new solutions so much as, as another thing that designers do is we amplify the voices of people, you know, by creating campaigns, brands, visuals, videos, um, posters, all of the above. And just going and looking at what some of these other countries who are more urgently facing the climate crisis because they are just positioned a little bit differently on the globe um, and just amplify what they have to say, amplify what they are requesting. And I guess, you know, the idea is if the negotiators of these larger, richer companies um, see that even their constituents are demanding these things, then it will help shift the power balance to these more vulnerable com uh, countries. Yeah, I'm wondering. I'm gonna I'm gonna make a really. I don't know if I even believe what I'm about to say, but um, the design community, there's a lot of designers in first world countries. Um, I don't know the statistics, I'll look it up after this. Um, at least in the US, AIGA is the, one of the uh, largest design associations and they do a lot of these like census type things and there's probably data in there. So what I'm getting at is I'm wondering, you know, how do we support those communicators, those designers in those uh, in third world countries? How do we support them to do this kind of work um, so that we can avoid this idea of design imperialism of designers going in and with good intentions, of course, but maybe not the best processes or how or ways to approach a community that they don't belong to? How do we actually support those that are actually in those communities. Yeah, again, be humble and realize that you have biases too. Mm -hmm. Even though you have good intentions, you don't necessarily know what you don't know. Right, and just a shameless plug, um, another reason uh, I bring this up is because I'm getting more and more excited about some of the new chapters that we're gonna be onboarding in the next couple of weeks. We have um, a handful, but some of them I'll call out specifically. We already have one, in Latin America, based in Brazil. We have another one coming on board, uh, our second one in India. We have another one in, um, oh, it's on the tip of my tongue. Portugal? Uh, can't remember. Yeah, Portugal, but I don't think that's a, I want to think that that would be a No, 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 country, I, I just know that that's one that we're onboarding. You have a few, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I get excited when I see our community reach into these other countries and so, like, how can we all learn from one another? How can we all yeah. learn and share resources so that we can uplift all of the designers within our community, every creative person um, within, so that they can do the work at that local level? Yeah, because Lord knows the media isn't going to help us find out what's, what they're saying and what they're demanding. Yeah. So we need to talk to each other and we need to talk about climate. So that's why we're doing this. That's why we're doing these um, Raise Some Hell sessions. We'll be doing this every two weeks on Wednesday evenings on our Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash climate designers. Give us a follow so you'll be notified when we come in, uh, come online. And uh, another shameless plug, uh, if you like what we're saying, we have a class that we're coming out with in two months-ish, one month, less than two months. Um, starts in early October and you can go to terra.do, T-E-R-R-A dot D-O, and click on Start Learning and go to Becoming a Climate Designer is what it's called. So we are working in partnership with terra.do, and they provide a lot of climate and professional career-related courses. They approached us to uh, teach a class about climate design. And so that is going live starting in October, and we're taking applications now until October 2nd. We'd love to have you. Yeah, and we'll dive into some of these topics and others throughout. And 
even between now and then, we'll be discussing some content from that course as well. So you can get us a little tease or a taste of what it is that we're going to be covering. Indeed. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Mark, for hanging out. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Anytime. Anytime.